Uh, thank, uh, thank you so much for uh, attending these conferences in, uh, in my place. Um, I, I'd like to thank Yong uh, uh, Kim, uh, who's not here yet, um, uh, for, invi uh, for the invitation. And um, well, this talk is going to be a little bit different from you know what you have been uh, presented so far. So the many of them would be numerics and the computations. And uh, I, I hope that by the end of this talk that I could give you a little bit of motivations for, uh, say, you know, how one could just simply attack some uh, some type of biological system, say cancer, uh, with the different prospects. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is about the glioblastoma, which is one of the brain cancer in your brain. Uh, and um, and at the end, I'm going to talk about a little bit of uh, oncolytic virus, uh, oncolytic viral therapy, which essentially using uh, oncolytic virus uh, in order to kill and target and kill these cancer cells. And um, so, let's see. Okay, so this work has been done uh, with the experimentalist at the Ohio State University here. So I when I was uh, at the MBI uh, at Ohio State University, uh, Evda Friedman and uh, this. He's a medical doctor. He used to be at the Ohio State, now he's went back to Harvard. And Sean Rollo is also an experimental uh, experimentalist who is doing the, uh, all these uh, experiments that uh, I'm going to show you uh, in a minute. And the Valvin Carver, who is also an experimentalist who is interested in um, uh, working on uh, oncolytic virus for the cancer therapy, especially for uh, uh, glioblastoma. And uh, it's the funding. Um, so, the, what is the glioblastoma? Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this glioblastoma, the glioblastoma is the one of the uh, you know very very aggressive uh, brain type brain cancer. Um, the typical lifespan or typical uh, survival time is less than one year, uh, typically in about the nine nine months or so. So once you are diagnosed, once the patient is diagnosed with uh, GBM or glioblastoma, uh, you know essentially this patient would be dead uh, in a, in a one year. So it's very critical. Um, uh, tumor and uh, so far the major treatment option is the surgery um, and but you know we are talking about brain so one has to be very uh, careful with the uh, this brain because you don't want to mess with your brain uh, because any very you know small mistakes uh, when you do the even surgery uh, small mistakes can lead to the very uh, severe uh, very uh, severe uh, side effects such as paralysis and all other things so the what what they do uh, in the real uh, for the real patients in the hospital is that they wanted to look at well they first of all they they just you know do this scanning so they they use the MRI data and other things in order to quantify where this you know tumor is located and so on now because they don't know there's many arguments about this and they don't know whether if they have to you know cut off all of this brain but you know and again uh, if you're talking about say the your gut say you know your the gut, then you can just simply take, okay, here's your gut, you know, can take it back. Just take another two or three centimeters away from this main tumor, it didn't have a problem, you can just, you know, chop it up and you can just put it together later and so on. It has no many uh, side effects and so on. It's not a big deal. But when it comes to the uh, brain, is a different matter. Uh, you don't want to mess with your brain. So if you, uh, even if you have this size of a tumor, you don't want to take all these half brains out, right? Uh, is your brain. So, they will typically, surgeons are trying to minimize the areas of the tumor uh, for the resection. So uh, what it does essentially is though, uh, it's a little bit tricky because uh, they, they have to depend on the image, uh, MRI images and so on. But, but what you don't see here is individual cells that has spread to this, uh, the neighboring tissue already, even when you're doing the surgery. So even if this is the image that you can see as a medical doctor, and you don't want to probably you want to take up this section, right? But maybe some of the individual cells, something that you cannot see, is going to be somewhere here, or there, or there. Then uh, would you like to take off all these brains out? Maybe not. So there is a, there is a problem, right? So. The, uh, of course, you know, this uh, typical surgery is going to be followed by uh, radiology, you know, radiotherapy and uh, this uh, chemotherapy and all of it. But all, none of these uh, methods are not working. You know, that's why it's, it's very critical and that's why once the patient's diagnosed, they, are they, they'll be dead in a, uh, in a year. So, this uh, glioblastoma is characterized by rapid proliferation and aggressive invasion. And for the most cases, even if you do the surgery, what you see is that within a seven month after the surgery, you are going to see a recurrence of the tumor somewhere here or there. Or there. 
It's just that you just don't see where they are now. Okay? And that is the major cause of the death. Uh, you can always do the surgery, but you know, at the time patients are still alive. But uh, by, I don't know, after uh, seven months or so, they will be dead because of this uh, recurrence in other parts of the brain. So the, uh, what they are interested in in the medical field is to uh, somehow see, uh, so this is the $1 million questions, right? So, um, so if, if you know this, then you can easily get a Nobel Prize for this. So, so they want to know where they are going, right? And they want to know a very smart strategy in order to eradicate these individual cells. So, what they do is ex in the experiments is very simple. Okay, so they start with okay, so you have the petri dish and you have the individual cells, right? You have the chunk of tumor put it in there. Then what you do see is the different patterning of these individual cells that are migrating away from this core. And again, this is the images that you can get in the lab, okay? And this usually these uh, these cell lines are from the real patient. And uh, you have real patients, uh, this uh, tissue, and then you just put it in a gel and you just, you watch over the, your, um, uh, under the microscope, you, know, you, you want to know where they are going, right? So, uh, so this is a typical image. What you can see is going to be this. Through the MRI, you, you, you are going to see only this, but not this individual cell, okay? Because it's too small. Typical cell size is about 10 micron, uh, 1,000 of millimeter. So you, you, there's no way for you to see this, uh, this individual cells through the MRIs. So, this is the images that you can get if you work with the experimentalist. Okay, so here, these individual cells are growing. So, uh, this here, cells are growing, but you can see many of these cells are migrating away from the main core, and you just don't, well, of course, this is a symmetric. It looks like a symmetric because you know, it's uh, obvious. It's, it's, it's put in a hotel, hotel, uh, homogeneous uh, medium so, uh, in the lab, so that's why they're just spreading all over. But in the real tissue, you just don't know where they're going to be, okay? Now, and there you can do a lot of uh, the experiments, even in this very simple setting. But, and of course, when you put the two of them, this is the thing that you can see, obviously, of course, this one's going away this direction, and this guy is going away this direction, but somehow there's a, some, a little bit of connection between two cell aggregates. They tend to adhere under certain conditions, not always. They, they have certain tendency of the adhesion. And also, if you have here, so here, down there, this is a, a relatively larger mass, and here's a, a relatively smaller mass, and look what happens. So here you go, this guy's growing and growing, but after for a while, this guy's going away from the main core. So these are the individual cells. This guy, this little guy is going away, but going back and going back and forth and so on. But this guy, eventually this is going away. But here, this guy, so some of them is going away from this and this one is eventually joins to the other islands. It also has a sort, certain level of the origin. So in other words, when you have other cells in your neighborhood, sometimes if you're in a bad condition, if you're in a very um, bad microenvironment, they are always trying to go away from the uh, southern area, which is called the negative chemotaxis. So the, uh, of course, so far, the, you know, many people are talking about the chemotaxis, which is simply uh, directed migration toward southern grand of the, you know, some food, right? Now, the negative chemotaxis is that you are trying to get away from some, something bad there. And the reason, and of course so far nobody really knows why they are doing it. First of all, the inherently, uh, they, they have, it's about the gene I think, and some of them, even medical doctors don't know about this, but this is what you see, and they have, they, they migrate away from the medical prim primarily because the cells at the center are dying because they don't have enough access to the uh, nutrients, so nutrients are in the medium. The nutrient has to be delivered to all the these cells. Cell has to have the food in order to survive. Now, this one has to be delivered or transported to the center of the tumor by diffusion. Of course, there's a certain limit of diffusion, so the profile of the typical uh, uh, nutrients is going to be like this. So outside you have a higher oxygen and higher glucose and all these nutrients, but at the center they don't have enough nutrients. So cells are dying, so they're screaming, oh, I can't say here. So they, they, they send out some, some weird signals that say, well, okay, you need to get out here. Here's the bad neighborhood, you have to get out. So that is just a kind of the behavior that you can see 
and that is called the negative chemotaxis. So these cells on the surface may go away from this one simply because they don't like this microenvironment. They don't want to. They want to go to the better place, but they they want to get uh, get away from the bad place. And also, if you have uh, this growing tumor, and when you put this little bit of bubble here, you see uh, this guy is just somehow surrounding this a little bit bubble. But here, see, this guy is going away, but this guy just come out, somehow is turning around, and this guy is around, somehow surrounds these little bubbles, and eventually, of course, this will recover, they will displace. But they have their own way of catching, or they have their own way of detecting their microenvironment for their migration. It's not like, you know, they are just randomly moving uh, in the microenvironment. They have, especially in the brain, especially in the brain, the brain has a very, very unique structure. They have, it's within the skull, right? So they have very solid brain structures, so blood vessels and all these structures that you have in there. And I'm going to show you in a minute that why is the case. And the, because of this very special structure of the brain uh, and the microenvironment, they have their own way of migration, which is different from other cell type of migrations in other tissue. So. Uh, and you can also do other type of uh, the experiments where uh, they, they can even now do, uh, uh, manipulate this uh, collagen fiber. So collagen fiber is one of the extracellular matrix they can find in your tissue. So if you look at your tissue, you always have the uh, collagen. Uh, you always have the extracellular matrix. It's one of the you know, little things. It's like a gel, hair gel. And if you look at it, you know, uh, uh, look at it on the microscope. You can see they have the network of the fibers, and these are the collagen fibers. Now they can manipulate this one so that this one can be aligned in one direction, or you can make it random. Okay, so when you put them in a random, randomly oriented matrix like this one, they oh, interesting. It's not moving. Hmm. Okay. Um, anyway, so if you put them in this randomly oriented collagen network, then uh, this uh, green, uh, green is a trajectory of individual cells and this uh, uh, red is the final position of individual cell. So you can see they are trapped. Okay, they are trapped. They, they don't have, uh, they don't have a tendency. They are trying to get away. They are trying to do the random work, but it's, it's more like, you know, in, in, it's like a tarja in a jungle. So, you know, just they, they have a little bit of fibers here and there. If you are just enclosed by the, all these fibers, they, they cannot move that much. However, if you put them in this align the fibers, then you can see these little guys are moving along the fibers because they have very solid substrates there so that they can follow. So uh, every cell do need uh, some kind of solid substrate in order to migration because they have to activate the uh, myosin and ectomyosin machinery uh, in order uh, for the cell migration. So they definitely need that. So they have their own way of migration. So then why is it so important to uh, analyze and the, uh, investigate this invasion pattern? As I said in the beginning, it's very important to understand where they are going. And it is very, understand, it is very important to analyze which type or phenotype or under what conditions this, they will form islands or, uh, or under what conditions these cells can become invasive cancer cells. Because that is very important. If that becomes invasive cancer cells, they can go anywhere in the brain. They can cause recurrence of the tumor, even after surgery and uh, or other uh, other treatment options and so on. So it's very important to understand this invasion pattern. So we started to look at uh, this invasion patterns and something that you can observe in the experiments. And and in vivo, if you put, if you inject these uh, real cell lines from the real patients into the brains of the mouse. Here's the injection site. And you see they grow here, but you see these cells are diffusing a little bit, but then you see these, they have their own track all the way down to here. So they have their tendency of migration. So they have very, uh, they have certain preference on the structure of the brain. So they tend to, for instance, they tend to follow the, uh, the micro vessels or blood vessels because they provide very solid substrate. Also, they, that is the source of the stem cells and the growth factors and so on. It generates very nice microenvironment so that they just tend to go there. However, 
they don't, you see, this side here is soon as the gray matter, and they, tends, they also tend to follow the white matter, not the gray matter, because gray matter tends to be stiffer than the uh, white matter. And so they like a soft material as well. And so they do have certain tendency of the migration, but it is not understood where they are going actually. So uh, distinct subgroups uh, according to molecular and phenotype criteria can form different patterning, say the spherical patterning or semi-adherent or adherent patterning and so on. So they can do uh, all kinds of experiments in order to classify this. But we, have, uh, being a mathematician, you'd like to, I'd like to characterize or I'd like to use some mathematical models in order to characterize this invasive behavior. Now, the, and of course, I'm going to skip this. Uh, so, of course, this, this slide simply shows that, you know, this patterning of the invasion gets very complicated in the presence of blood vessels and the formation of, uh, formation of the blood vessels, which is called angiogenesis. And the typical angiogenesis is a little bit different from this sort of the micro scale, the formation of these uh, blood vessels and so on. So, which or not gives you adds to the another uh, complexity into the system. But I'm not going to talk about this one, but it's uh, way more complex than we think. So, here's the mathematical model. So, in order to understand this system, I'm not interested in the growth. Of course, you can always put the growth in here, and I'm going to uh, later talk about the growth. <laughs> but I'm going to look at this system. So, rather than looking at the growth of the individual or growth of the whole tumor, I am interested to see the patterning here in this area. So I will call this as invasion area. Yeah. So this at the center of the spheroid they will grow, but the cells on the surface will start migrating away from the main core and they will do form their patterning here. Now so I'm gonna take a little section here. So I'm gonna take this little section and then I, I will call this one is my domain. So this gamma 1 is going to represent this surface of the domain, this green spheroid, and then this side would be far away field somewhere around here, and these two little sections is represented by these little sections here and there. So now this, in my computation domain, cells is going to be injected here because it's called the shredding. They, for some reason, they sh are shredded. So they, they, they will just, you know, detach themselves from the main core, and then they start migrating. So I'm going to introduce a shredding operator here, and then the cell be cells will be introduced in here, and they will migrate in this direction in general because typically in the background you have the glucose which is the uh, major uh, the which essentially is a sugar that is a major uh, the nutrients that you can use and nobody uh, even cells cannot live without glucose so there's a major uh, major cause um, that of course will be uh, that is also a source of the chemotactic source so the uh, I am introducing these four equations for tumor cell density and the extracellular matrix density and the MMP and the glucose. And the equations for uh, the glucose is obvious and there's a diffusion, there's a consumption uh, by tumor cells. So it's the glucose is consumed by tumor cells in a linear fashion and also uh, tumor cells will have random motility but also they will uh, be attracted to uh, the gradient of the glucose. So this is a conventional, well, without this denominator, that is the typical, the chemotactic terms. But we, we introduced this, uh, this denominator just to make sure that this gradient, you know, in order to prevent the blob, say. So the, uh, if you do this, that this, this term here is going to be bounded. Uh, so that essentially helps the, uh, the for the regularity uh, and the existence of solutions. So the, you have these chemotactic terms, and this term here, and coupled with these equations, and this equation is called the haptotaxis. So the biological, from biological, biological point of view, what it does essentially very simple. When the cells are trying to migrate, they tend to adhere to the uh, certain adhesive molecules in the extracellular matrix. In this case, it's the extracellular matrix here, ECM. So this ECM is consumed by MMP. So this equation is quite classical in this uh, cancer research field. So in one dimensional, you can think of this way. Say, this is the tumor, and this can be ECM. So it's the extracellular matrix, so you can say this is empty space. Now tumor cells will secrete MMP, so the tumor cell will secrete MMP, and then 
what, uh, and then this lambda 32, this is the decay rate of MMP. So MMP is the proteases. That is the things that tumor cells use in order to break out all these extracellular matrix components so that they can make a tunnel, so that they can migrate to a certain directions. So because of this, they have the huge, very large values of decay rate. So they, the half-life is very uh, large. So tumor cells, on the tip of the individual cells, so in the tip of the migration cells, they tend to generate this very high concentration of the MMP. So uh, that means that uh, because of the terms that you have here, uh, they will have this sort of MMP on the front a migrating uh, front line of the tumor cell uh, the population. So now they are going to use this MMP in order to degrade this and of course after one time then this one will be go away this way so they will proceed and this ECM will be uh, degraded and this one will be again this MMP is going to use uh, in order to generate this sort of migration. Okay, So that is very conventional sort of the approach. But they're going to use this term, and then, and then, and then they have uh, this uh, uh, growth term, uh, uh, very small growth terms, and then they have this another term. It's called the cell-cell adhesion. So the cell has their tendency to uh, for the adhesion. So when they are together, they tend to adhere each other. Uh, so this term here, it is called, uh, which was represented in this integral form, and this was introduced in the ecologic systems as well. Uh, but uh, this term essentially represents the, the tendency toward the adhesion, so cell tends to adhere each other. And you have then a shedding operator at the end, so shedding operator is necessary because we are interested in the patterning on this domain, not in the center. So somehow, from mathematical point of view, it's a little bit tricky because you know you don't want to use that as a boundary condition because that has to be continuous and that is you know has a little bit of problems uh, uh, in, in many sense. So we introduced the shredding operator. So this shredding operator essentially generates this collection of the mass here on the surface of the uh, growing tumor and then this one will now follow this chemotaxis and the render mark and this uh, haptotactic migration in addition to this uh, cell cell addition between them. And then they were their own way. They, so once they, are, they are, once they are introduced into the system, then they will just uh, uh, the form certain patterns in this domain. So the KN is the interior made all over the place or certain? Uh, oh, that, that is a very good question. So I forgot to put in here. So this is very, uh, the very local. So this not really is a semi local. Say this is okay, this is integral over the this little ball. So what you do is that um, if you are here, if tumor cell is here in a position X at time T, then you have this ball, so ball with the radius R at the center of T here. And so that essentially the idea is that when when cell is here they have their very special ability to detect their neighboring cells. Say, if they, another cells are here, then we, if there is, this cell is within this radius, is, which is called the sensing radius, then they can detect where they are. And if their cells are here, then they can detect this guy. They can dis detect this guy. And this guy also can detect this one. So other cells can be detected by tumor cells at a given center uh, as long as they are within the sensing radius. Of course, if for, the, for these other cells that are outside of this ball, they cannot detect this. And this, this is typically like uh, anywhere between 10 to the 50 microns. Sometimes they can be even 150 micron as a diameter for the sensing radius. And experimentally, they can uh, measure these values. And uh, up to certain values, they can actually detect their neighborhood so that they, have, they form uh, certain aggregates. Um, that is uh, exactly the, the terms that we have. So this integral has to be uh, over this ball with the radius, uh, the sensing radius R. That means that uh, uh, moving boundary problems in, in this model? Or? Uh, no, no, no. Domain is the fixed. Domain is fixed, and uh, we are not interested in to look at this growing uh, free boundary problem. We are. We just want to look at this the patterning of individual cells in this particular fixed domain. So this is the fixed domain here. 
fixed domain. And as you can see in the movie, the, the migration speed, uh, if you calculate this migra migration speed, you can ignore this uh, growth terms a little bit. And then for that particular case, we can just consider this one little section where this, on, this individual patterning up formed in this. So we are ignoring this uh, growing parts here at the center. So the radius of R is changing. No, the, uh, this radius of R is uh, fixed. So this is biologically observed uh, value. So the, of course, the, from computation point of view, you can always test you know, what happens when you extend or when you use the large values of this and small values of this. But uh, for typical simulations, that has to be fixed. So it turns out that uh, there's a very where there are very important three parameters that can determine the self uh, cell migration patterning. So one is the chemotactic sensitivity, and the other one is the haptotactic sensitivity, and the other one is the strength of the cell cell adhesion. So those three key, uh, key parameters happens to be key parameters that can generate all possible patterns that you have been observed in the experiments, at least in our modeling framework. So the uh, specific definition of the uh, sense, uh, this uh, shredding operate, uh, operators looks like this. So essentially, you know, very little strips on the, on these little strips on you know, on the left. You just simply introduce the mass of these uh, uh, cells. So essentially, you are introduce uh, some uh, the tumor mass uh, into the system. But you have to be careful because, uh, as you can see in the movie, you uh, you don't want to have any heavy congestion. So uh, you you want to make sure that you give a one shot and then let them go away. Naturally, they will go away to the, to the right because there's a chemotactic forces that drives them. So the, uh, there's a higher gradient of the glucose on the right hand side. So they will, as soon as you introduce this mass into the system, this one will go to the right. So once this one is go away from the, uh, these little strips, then you give another shot, and which represents another shedding from the growing tumor. Okay. So that is a little bit technical, but the one has to be one has to avoid this uh, congestion. Otherwise, uh, the, this uh, the patterning that you are interested in uh, uh, is not is not going to happen. And also, that is not biologically uh, relevant. So the, this is a typical time course of the system. So the and again, this tumor mass is introduced here on these very little strips, and there's uniformly distributed structural matrix, and the, there's nothing there as for the MMP, and there's a very uh, the glucose levels looks like this. But this, you know, here you have the normal boundary conditions here and there and here. So with the periodic conditions here, so you you can have this very you know, steady uh, sort of relatively steady uh, profiles of the glucose. Now you have three. Uh, three terms that control their migration behavior. So the uh, tumor cells tends to go to the right hand side, of course, because they have to respond to the glucose. So essentially, you are just going to these directions. But well, on the way to do that, they also have to re respond to this MMP uh, driven extracellular matrix structure here. So extracellular matrix has very complex structures like it because that depends on the consumption of the tumor cells and or degradation of the CM by MMP, which was secreted by the MMP, uh, tumor cells and so on. So this one tumor cells then uh, also has to respond to the structure of the extracellular matrix. And also, they also has to have the cell cell adhesions there. So the, you know, these three combinations, they can you know, just form this different pattern here. So you can see this, this little picks of MMP, uh, this one is going to match with this uh, location of the tumor cells because the tumor cells is the source of the MMPs. And there's very uh, strong uh, decay rates. That means that they will just simply disappear uh, as soon as, that, as the source term is, is gone. OK, so then uh, uh, the, when you compare simulation results with the experimental data, this is the patterning. So if you, for instance, increase the hypothetic sensitivity on the x-axis and the, on, uh, on the y-axis, if you uh, put the different parameter values of the cells or the agent, uh, you will have different patterning here. So this is one slide of tumor cells uh, for this particular choice of the uh, uh, the parameter set, and this is another parameter set, and another parameter set, and so on. Now, this patterning of individual cells, uh, individual tumors, uh, has been observed biologically. For instance, if you look at this, that is a little bit, uh, that is similar to these branching patterns that you observed in this. Uh, or you can, you can see here, somewhere here, so this is a mixture of this uh, little branching with uh, these uh, islands, and the, this island patterning has been observed in the experiments in the, in the mouse as well. So it makes sense actually, because if 
if you are here, this is more like a diffusive, uh, diffusive uh, patterning. While when you increase cell cell adhesion, that means the cell cell has to adhere to each other. When you uh, increase the cell cell adhesion parameter, then they 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 have strong bonds. Uh, 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 among them, then uh, they will prevent any further migration away from the main core, so they will stop there. So this is the ideal case that we'd like to see, right? But if you have very relatively small cell cell adhesion, then when you increase the heptotactic sensitivity, then you uh, tend to form uh, this sort of uh, uh, branching parents, for instance. So you can do a lot of simulations for uh, generating uh, this different patterning. Like this, and of course, if you uh, use this analyst domain for the computation domain, then you uh, you can sometimes, depending upon uh, different set of the parameters, uh, for the regular uh, the MMP production rates, you can see this. Uh, this is at the final time. This is the special profile of tumor cells at the final time, uh, say 45, uh, for 48 hours after the injection, and then uh, they they tend to form the diffusive uh, or diffuse uh, patterning here, and also sometimes they can generate this. Uh, 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 branching patterns as well. So this was this model was then used to, uh, to characterize uh, the invasive behavior of uh, or invasion patterns uh, in in the in vitro system. Now. What he found was, though, uh, in the in vitro system, there was very consistent, and uh, in some pictures in the in, in mouse model. But uh, when it comes to the real situation, the situation is more, much more complicated. So the, we wanted to develop some very uh, skilled uh, technical schemes uh, in order to in order to uh, eradicate this invisible infiltrating individual tumor cells. And again, these individual tumor cells are a major cause of the death. You want to track down and you want to kill them. The problem is, and of course at the last slide that I'm going to show oncolytic virus where you can use the oncolytic virus in order to track down and just kill them. But there is a rather passive way of killing them. Um, essentially, you have you know, thieves moving around here and they are trying to you know, send your police to catch them and just kill them, right? But we wanted to use a little bit uh, different scheme in order to uh, kill all these invisible individual cells. So the uh, long time ago, well, say well, three or four years ago, uh, my experimentalist at uh, Ohio State University at the time uh, did screening for the microRNA. So microRNA is one of the molecules that you have in this system. So you know this is one of the molecules that you have in the cells in your body, and they did uh, they do all these kinds of experiments in order to characterize which uh, microRNA is, is responsible for the their behaviors of the cell migration and uh, the proliferation because it is very important to characterize there as a migration patterning because that is the things that you can use as a as a as a drug so the what the pharmaceutical companies are interested in is that they wanted to use certain pathways intracellular signaling pathways in the cell in order to block or inhibit certain pathways in order to somehow, you know, block their behaviors, for instance. So, it's very important to understand what is the key signaling networks that are responsible for cell migration, especially the cell migration, because that uh, cause the, uh, well, I mean, this is a very interesting question if you think about it. I mean, the growth, so either it turns out that this is BIR51 essentially responsible, so if BIR51 is upregulated, that leads to the cell proliferation. But when you knock out BIR51, that tends to form this you know, invasive patterning, which means that BIR51 can be used for cell migration or proliferation. Now you can always suppress it down. The problem is, it's not that simple. Patients are dying because of growing, of gro growing tumor, but patients are also dead because these individual cells are migrating around. So both are bad. Then what are you going to do? So one has to be very careful in order to develop this sort of scheme. So far, this, the schemes that I'm going to say uh, is going to be, it has not been approved in the medical field yet, but uh, the, at least at the uh, level of mathematical modeling, we can uh, suggest something new. And, uh, and in response to high or low glucose levels, tumor cells either uh, show these growing patterns or migratory patterns. Now I'd like to use this signaling networks that are shown in this slide in order to characterize their behavior so that we can use these signaling networks for our own purpose. Now this intracellular signaling network can be interpreted in a very simple networks that 
is shown here. So if you just look at this, and, uh, and you can just see, okay, this hemobody presents inhibition, and this arrow indicates the inductions. Now, if you use these diagrams, and you can uh, interpret these uh, diagrams into these mathematical models, they look like this. And it turns out that uh, in response to either low or high glucose, or intermediate uh, levels of glucose, these tumor cells either show migratory or proliferative or both behaviors. So the, when G, glucose levels are slow, is a migratory phase, so that means that mitophion level is downregulated, but AMPK is upregulated, and when G is high, it's the other way around. And when G is the intermediate level, they do the both. In other words, they will depend on history, on the path. In, the, in other words, they depend on initial conditions. So, if you look at this, then this is very simple histolysis uh, diagrams that you can typically see in this kind of system. And on the axis, is this is a glucose level, and on the y-axis is steady state values of mid-51. And this is very simple. Okay, so when you are here in the lower uh, branch, this is stable, and this is stable, and this is unstable. And this branch will represent the invasion pattern, and this represents will, this will lead to the proliferation. Now, in real situation, in your in real brain, you always have a constant fluctuation of the glucose in the brain because you, each time you have a coffee uh, that contains the sugar, uh, sugar is the glucose essentially, so that get into the blood system and they get into the brain and then they will fluctuate in your brain. Now, the individual cells will have this fluctuation of the glucose in the brain. Now, in response to this fluctuating glucose levels, what is going to be the cell's behavior? That is the question. And it turns out that under the stochastic uh, the perversions, this system happens to be very robust uh, under this perversion, which somehow indicates that the system has very, very robust uh, with respect to perversion, which means that in some sense it's good and in some sense it's bad, but from a pharmacological, uh, pharmacological point of view, that is good because that is very stable in terms of, uh, uh, you know, finding these antibodies or these you know, inhibitor was or these drugs that are uh, targeting certain uh, the pathways. So we wanted to use uh, these signaling pathways to couple to this, uh, this typical sort of the mathematical models of the tumor growth. And so somehow we wanted to use this system to characterize uh, this cell's behavior. So fundamental questions, then I'm not going to go through this system, but except the fact that this system is quite similar to what you have shown in the uh, previous slides. Um, it's, it's just that this tumor cell's behavior for the migration, say this random motility, chemotaxis, epitotaxis, these things will be activated only when this mid 50 level is less than threshold, and they will grow only when this mid 50 level is higher than threshold. Okay? So this ODE system is essentially coupled with this, uh, the PD systems. Then the first question that when we started this project, the one of the key questions that my experimentalist asked was, well, if you have same amount of the glucose, let's say in one hand, let's supply them in a very steady way, and in one, another way, you can give an injection in a period infection. Under what conditions will tumor grow faster? That is the question. Experimentalist didn't have any idea. His so essentially we were betting uh, with the ten dollars and I won and um, and the idea was that if you give a steady injection uh, if you give a periodic injection of the glucose so here let's suppose that you are starting with the same size of the tumor here now this tumor will grow but this will grow only when they have enough glucose if they don't have enough glucose what they do is so this is the case glucose is low so they will get away from the main core, just like these individual cells that are represented by these blue circles. And then, once you give an injection, now you are happy, all these cells are happy, now they have enough access to the glucose, then they will grow. And then, once glucose level is going down, because it's natural, because glucose is going to be consumed by growing tumor, so you have growing tumor, therefore, they, you have a higher consumption of tumor cells, therefore, they will you will see the glu glucose withdrawal, then they will start to invade again, and so on. So they will go through this cycle of the invasion, 
growth, invasion, growth, and so on. On the other hand, if you give a steady supply of globus, then tumor cells will just simply grow in a very steady fashion. At the end, if you compare that, this case with this case, in response to this periodic injection of the glucose, which is represented by this uh, red curve here, at the end, these tumors with the fluctuation wins. This, well, for them, you know, tumor grow faster when you give you a periodic injection of the glucose. The reason is, when they are repeating this cycle, they have more space to grow. So once they are away from the main core, they have enough space to settle down, they start growing again. So they will generate faster growth because cells, they can catch their physical environment. So when they are compressed too much, they cannot grow. So the, uh, that was the uh, idea. And then uh, our idea was then, well, well let, me, let me show this one first. So the, our uh, sort of radical idea was uh, that well, one here is that the, nobody actually has done this one in the clinical setting yet. Um, it's just from just my brain. Is that why don't we just simply uh, inject chemotractant somewhere on the periphery of the growing tumor? so that we can attract them back. So here's the problem. You have growing tumor, okay, for the growing tumor is not a problem, you can get it out. You can, you can take it out by your surgery. It is the individual cells that are migrating away. These are the cells that will grow back after the surgery. And these are the cells that will cause the problem. Now, and the problem is you don't know where they are and you don't see where they are. That is the problem. It's very, just, just too little. It's just too little. Of course, in real experiments, uh, in, the, in the mouse, they may be able to do it if they do the chopping and very do uh, all these things. But in, for the real patients, no, no way. In real patients, would you like to go to this hospital and just, okay, why don't you open up your brain and just you know, do all the things? You don't want to do that, right? So, so they're not going to do it. So, so the idea is then, why don't we inject a little bit of chemotractant on the surface or, or on the periphery of the growing tumor after the resection. So this is the initial condition. So let's suppose that there's a huge growing tumor here. Let's suppose that these guys are gone. So let's say you already took away by your surgery. Now let's suppose that we don't see where they are. So we don't see this individual gray, this, uh, this uh, red dots, which is the individual migratory cells. Now, inject chemotractant on the periphery of this growing tumor, uh, then they, hopefully, they can respond and they can come back to this area, and then we might be able to do the secondary surgery to resect them. Of course, you have to cut off a little bit more tissue than before, but that's better than being dead, I guess. So that is the idea. And, but that was the very naive idea. Uh, when we uh, did simulation, what we found was that actually on the way back to this resection site, in the presence of the blood vessels, which is represented in these black dots here, they tend to attract it to, to this blood vessel because that is the source of the, all these nutrients. And that's a very nice environment they want to settle down. So that's why actually they, they have jobs. So when they are moving around, it's not just, it's, a, it's not pure random work. They have their own way. They have tendency to aggregate or they have tendency to uh, migrate toward or along the blood vessels. So they happens to be, so when, if they are close enough to the blood vessels on the way back to this resection site in response to chemotaxis, they tend to form aggregates near the blood vessel. So then we thought, okay, then why don't you do, why, why don't you do the combination therapy? In other words, inject the chemotractant in order to bring them back, but only the cells that can be bring them back. For those of cells that are aggregated near the blood vessels, we can use the chemo surgery, chemotherapy. Because the major failure of the chemotherapy is due to the BBB. I don't know if you're familiar with the BBB. BBB is the blood, uh, blood, you know, blood barrier. Um, uh, in the brain, so the brain, you know, in the brain, is it, very, is very highly organized. So it's a, a typical drugs, ke typical chemo drugs, is not going to penetrate this wall of the blood vessels, and only just a small fraction of them can get a, get get out of this, you know, the blood vessel. That's why uh, uh, this little fraction is not going to, uh, you know, go to this all this tumor site. That's the, uh, that's why it's not working. 
Uh, but if they are already aggregated here on the blood vessel, just like in here, then we can do the chemo here. So for those these cells are attracted to the blood vessel, we can do the chemo. And then for, for the rest, we can attract them back to this resection site and then do the secondary surgery. That is the idea. So of course, from, uh, we can do a mathematical analysis for this one and so on, but um, that was the idea. So let's, uh, how much time do we? Over? Okay, okay, then I guess uh, I'm gonna just stop here.